Welcome back everyone. Today we are talking about sleep apnea and other airway issues in kids. This is something I know almost nothing about. So to solve that problem, I've interviewed my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Nick Duvis. He's gonna explain everything you need to know. So without further ado, let's do this thing. Thank you so much for coming over. First of all, I appreciate that because I know that you are a busy man. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the only thing I kind of wanted, the reason I brought you here is that I know dentistry is changing, like especially in the last 30 years, especially, you know, we've seen us going from primarily the, you know, the name dentist indicates we fix teeth. That's just the way we've kind of designed to be fixing teeth. But now we're facing problems that we weren't prepared for in dental school. You know, you have like chronic pain issues, you have people who have airway issues, you know, cancer patients that have no saliva left because of the therapy they've gone through, and then we're expected to manage all this. Uh, I know one of the, the big problems that you've been really interested in dealing with is um, airway issues, and in particular, you have like a more recent interest in kids, is that right? Yeah, no, I think uh, I think kids are always are the backbone of our society, and I kind of like, um, um, you know, I just like learning more and more, and I think from doing orthodontics for a long period of time and, you know, worried about growth and development. It's, you know, that understanding of how it can actually affect kids and maybe, um, you know, improve the lives of kids for sure. So are you saying that with growth and development and stuff like that, that airway, for example, plays a role in that? hundred percent. If you look at the way, um, kids have, uh, um, you know, will develop if they don't develop a good airway, if they don't have the proper tongue function, if they don't have all the, you know, vitamins, minerals, things like that, even um, to grow properly, then it actually will make a difference. So like, for example, I had asthma as a kid, right? right. And that was definitely related to things like allergies and stuff like that. Um, do you think asthma could have like affected my development? It can, depending on how you're breathing and what you're, you know, what's going on. Again, we talk about kids and at night is how they're sleeping and, and uh, you know, you can, you can see it. I mean, there's no reason for a kid to be snoring at night, for example, right? If you really think about it, you know, um, everything should be patent, you know, everything's developing. But when you look at, let's say, asthma, you look at allergies, especially in a place where we live, mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of dust, a lot of pollens, a lot of allergies, mm -hmm. um, a lot of dryness, then... What ends up happening is it'll affect um, the way the tongue sits in the mouth and, and as a result, um, not being able to um, affect in your swallow pattern and that swallow pattern being affected can be mouth, affect mouth breathing and that mouth breathing, again, can lead to airway issues uh, that compound themselves over time. So it's almost like a perpetual problem because one leads to the other. Yeah. So I've been like watching your kids grow up. Have you been just like listening next to their doors like are they snoring are they snoring 100 <laughs> percent. it's interesting so again i think part of the reason why you get involved in something is if you do have kids or you're interested in kids then in my case uh, both of my children um you know i could see signs of uh, child sleep apnea in them mm -hmm. and so we took the necessary steps early on um you know to uh to make a difference one of the earliest courses i probably took this is maybe about 19 years ago, I um, really talked about growth and development in kids. And there was a gentleman by the name of Jim Gary um, who talked a little bit about how, um, you know, us changing away, let's say, from nursing, um, you know, makes a difference because um, the way the child makes a lip seal and what they're supposed to do um, actually will affect, um, you know, the how their swallowing reflex is. And as a result of a lot of those studies that happen, they actually develop different nipples that you put on bottles. So for parents, really? they can't. Yeah, it's called like the nook nipple, for example. Uh -huh. really is designed to resemble how what would happen with breastfeeding and it's important that we you do that because if you don't you won't get the proper seal and then the swallowing reflex changes and you can have a child that continues on with a infantile swallow which will also make a you know a bit of a difference mm -hmm. and combined with that actually is interesting he um, we talked about if you can um, you know I think the encouragement is for as many moms as possible to nurse for a while if you can because a lot of that there are certain um, factors that are in their antibodies etc which will help with um, um, with allergies and making things fight being able to fight things off a little bit better for mm -hmm. sure. So essentially that, the, back to the nipples. <laughs> so yeah, you're, sure. Absolutely. You always go back to the nipples. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. you're, essentially, you're essentially saying that it, it influences the position of the lips such that growth and development occurs more naturally. Is that what happens or is it? When you go to swallow, it you have to create a seal, mm -hmm. right? When you don't have teeth, 
that seal is created with the tongue shooting forward and the lips actually coming together as one. Mm -hmm. But what also happens is that the child actually grabs onto the nipple and it squeezes it, flattens it, and brings it into their mouth. Again, this helps position their tongue in a little better position and gets them ready for when they do have teeth, where they put their teeth together, the tongue races to the roof of the mouth, and then they actually swallow um, a little bit normally later on. So that infantile swallow has to continue on. And, you, you know, that's why even tooth development is important. So hard teeth developing, how are kids making sure that, you know, they aren't mouth breathing so that we can close our uh, teeth together and allow the tongue to coat the roof of the mouth. And that will actually um, help with this, with the swallowing pattern. And by taking the tongue to the roof of the mouth, it also helps with the palate development, which is, of course, the upper jaw. Yeah. And when you have the upper jaw developed properly, you have less chance of having, you know, an issue. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that if you, when I grew up, we had a thing, basically, if you were to make some fun of somebody, mm -hmm. you would call them a mouth breather, uh -huh. right? And you think to yourself, well, why, how did that ever come about? Mm -hmm. You know, because one of the problems is that mouth breathing, um, you have an, you will have more of an issue of not getting proper sleep. Mm -hmm. and by not getting proper sleep, you won't get proper brain development. By not getting proper brain development, you'll have troubles learning in school. Mm -hmm. So as a result, your IQ will be less because you're a mouth breather. So Crazy. actually, yeah, so the reason why that came about is all because of the fact that mouth breathing um, you know, will affect you. And so all these kids, you know, that we might think are ADD or ADHD, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's nothing wrong with um, looking at those. But I, sometimes you got to wonder, is do we need medication yeah. or do you just need to give them a proper night's sleep? Yeah, because I remember being down at LVI that one time and they had that video that showed the one, the one mother and she was taking her child everywhere and it ended up being like an airway issue. And once they got the airway corrected, like all these behavior problems that had plagued this child for so long right. almost a hateful child right. suddenly he became normal again in yeah. this in this one case now you know in your experience have you seen things happen like that or is it more of a well, moderate effect or yeah i think even you know when i look at one of my former assistants actually you know her son when we looked at him we she could show me a picture of you know him sleeping and um, his mouth was open, actually. You know, she showed me how he was sleeping, and she has a good picture of it. We took a, a um, we took a, a side scan of his um, of his head to see where the adenoids were. Big adenoid mass. Again, he went in, and uh, we referred him to the ENT to get adenoids and tonsils removed. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he can now breathe through his nose. So oh, that's wow. is an issue. So if you can breathe, if you can't breathe through your nose. You have to breathe through your mouth. That's obvious, right? Yeah. So you want to make sure that there's good development all the way through so that even with expanding the upper jaw, I mean, when the upper jaw, um, when, you, when you swallow, it, the tongue will go to the roof of the mouth. It'll, ex it'll help keep the jaw expanding and growing properly. It doesn't just help with the jaw itself where the teeth come together, but inside your nose, it also expands that passageway so you can have more, more, um, more air get in through there. Yeah. Was well, even like when I'm thinking about it now, when I'm breathing through my nose, I can feel that the, my even my tongue out against the roof of my mouth. So there's always right. that passive pressure there, I guess. That but as sense. soon as you start breathing through your mouth, or you're talking, then of course the tongue drops, right. and then you lose that that pressure, that constant pressure on the palate. Yeah. So, do you think that is it? There, is there like an easy solution to get someone to like convert from like you know mouth breathing, which ideally we don't want, to nose breathing like a simple solution or is it just like yeah i think well first of all there are people out there that again you know with uh myofunctional therapy that can help you know is one thing but i think the biggest thing is you know to talk to your dentist or you know and and basically see if you have some scans you look at the tonsils look at the adenoids mm -hmm. And also tell if they're snoring. Like I ask a lot, all my patients when they bring in their children, we always, we like to have the parents in the back with us because yeah. we ask the question, I said, does your child snore? And they'll say yes or no. I said, does your child grind their teeth? Two things that seem to be indicative of actually airway issues. Mm -hmm. Grinding the teeth is an interesting one because by grinding your teeth, what we, they think is possibly happening is that your jaw is trying to find that position that is the most comfortable for it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's trying to say, okay, where exactly can I get there? And your jaw, you always want to try and get air in no matter what. Yeah. So it's moving around. So there's a correlation between bruxism or grinding teeth. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, just because there's, you know, correlation doesn't mean it's always cause and effect, yeah. right? But at the same time, we do know that. So I think it's that, but I think the snoring is the number one. There's zero reason for a child to snore unless they're mm -hmm. sick or something yeah. like that where they can't get away. But generally... If the, if the parent tells me that, um, 
Many times we'll take a scan uh, of this patient, and if we don't see anything, again, we'll refer them to the ENT. And in fairness to the ENTs, they've been taught in the, from the past, sometimes maybe they don't need... They used to take out tonsils and adenoids because um, that's just what they did in, yeah. you know, back when we were young. But then there was a period where there was some literature out there that said that possibly tonsil adenoids serve some function. Mm -hmm. And so they were a little less likely to do it, right? Yeah. Unless a child had you know, even ear infections, right? And they start, then they start taking them out. But I think, you know, to me, if there's any snores with that, you need to get the child to breathe. That's the number one thing. Yeah. And they got to be breathing at night so they can be rested. Yeah. Oh. And do you think like most, so say you see, you go, you take your child to the end, you hear your child, they're snoring yeah. and you get concerned about them because they're not sick, but they're just, you know, chronically snoring and you take them until you see your dentist. Right. Um, and say your dentist takes a look and there's huge tonsils in there, just mm -hmm. massive. Is the dentist going to be struggling to be able to like refer them to an ENT to get those out? Are they usually on the same page with that or do they? It depends on the ENT, right? So, um, you know, I found that the majority of times that, you know, who I've referred to has been pretty um, amenable to doing it as long as I describe as to why. Yeah. Um, I think it's important whatever dentist you go to is that they do have a little bit of knowledge on it. I've seen some things a little bit. I think that also helps a little bit, right? By, by hearing that so that the ENT will understand exactly where, where everything is going. So, so in uh, other words, go to him when you hear your child snoring, <laughs> not me. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think parents, you know, I think they, they're very aware of so many different things now, which is nice. So, you know, they ask the questions and, you know, hopefully you get the answers. And we've had a few times where it has been in, the past and you know some ENTs have refused to whatever and then we just push forward and we talk to them about it again and almost always they'll oblige over a period of time yeah. both of my kids had their tonsils that noise removed both of my children snore before did not snore after mm -hmm. right and so it made a huge difference in their growth and development yeah. both of my kids are in the 90s in their schoolwork so yeah. maybe there's a correlation hey there you go <laughs> take your tonsils out you'll be a genius <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Now, like, so I know we've talked about growth and development, but just to make it like dead simple for everyone. So say what happens, what happens if your child is snoring, they don't get their tonsils out, you know, long term, what's, what's going to happen? Or what do you think is going to happen? What are some of the implications? Well, I think, again, some things can correct themselves, just like yeah. your childhood asthma can go away over time. So it does happen. I'm not going to sit here and say that it doesn't happen at all. But if it doesn't, you know, or during that time that it is happening, you have to wonder about what the brain development is. Your brain needs oxygen at night. I mean, it will struggle to get oxygen. It will do everything in its power to get oxygen because mm -hmm. that's what it needs. And it, in a child where the, everything's growing and developing, um, it's vital that, uh, you know, we have good oxygenation at night. So, um, you know, so you want to make sure that, you know, if you don't do that, then I think it is affecting their, um, like you said, even their mood. Um, I think their ability to learn is the biggest thing, yeah. right? And so we want to uh, just make sure that, uh, you know, that isn't happening. So that's, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, always in medicine, it's very difficult to have complete cause and effect for yeah. everything. Totally. But I think if you piece this all together and we look at the, the results of adults, you know, then uh, we'll see that there's, you know, there's things that uh, um, definitely it makes a difference. If if people are dying at young ages because they're just dying in their sleep, yeah. you know, because of sleep apnea, it tells you it's a pretty significant disease. It's an issue that we should deal with. It's also well correlated that if you do snore mm -hmm. or grind at night, you will do the same as an adult. So... Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we attack that early so that there isn't muscle engramming too, mm -hmm. because the, oh, sorry, not just muscle, but brain engramming. So you're, yeah. so you're turning around and, um, and it's sending a signal. Okay. This is what we do at night, right? Yeah. Just try and stay alive. So, and, uh, you got to try and change, break up that, uh, programming for sure. Yeah. Now say something a bit less, you know, significant than taking out tonsils or something, but say you're just doing a palatal expander and for those of you who don't know what that is it's like that little device you may have heard of it when they they turn the little key in the roof of the mouth uh, on the appliance and it pushes the palate apart with time now if you think about that that's technically creating a little bit more airway would it not be yes so when i first referred to what do we do because we we're talking about young children so yeah. we have to have different times uh -huh, um you know that we're that uh, you know different times and stages in their life what they're doing so the very first thing let's talk about an infant for example mm -hmm. the infant goes um, with your infant, 
if they don't have proper tongue development, for example, if they have a tongue tie, yeah. right? We want to try and release that tongue and get rid of the tongue tie. We know the tongue tie. It's uh, they come up with usually what they call micro uh, microstomia. I think is what it is. So they actually don't uh, the the mouth doesn't develop. So we got to make sure we release the tongue tie. That's usually an easy snip that happens. Kids don't like it. Yeah. Right. Obviously, <laughs> newborns don't like if it. If they did, I'd be concerned. About them. <laughs> That's right. So they usually cry. And so once we do it, again, the mother can nurse right away. Yeah. Right. Just sort of comfort the child when that yeah. does happen. Right. Because okay. obviously, there's a little bleeding. That's number one. Mm -hmm. As they get older, when you're talking about the three, four year olds, mm -hmm. right? Anywhere up to, you know, age 12 is where we start looking at are they growing their teeth? Are they snoring? What's mm -hmm. exactly going on? And then with them, that's where we talk about the referrals to the ENTs. Both my kids were about age three or four. Oh, when pretty early then. Hey? Yeah, when yeah. we had it done. So we did it pretty early, knowing growth and development. I wanted to make sure that they had ample opportunity to grow. Yeah. And then... Before uh, they go into school, right? That's right. Before they go into <laughs> get school. the A's in kindergarten. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Got to make sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, my son was... We weren't sure how good he was going to be. He didn't talk much. We didn't think much. But then he ended up surprising us later oh, on. So. <laughs> um, then, of course, later on... Now we're talking about intervention with, uh, you know, orthodontics, right? Where what, I'll, what we'll do is we'll go in and now create different ways to create airways. And I actually can't just do it with, with um, kids. We actually started doing it with adults where we, we will take the jaw and we'll expand it this way. Mm -hmm. But we also have appliances that expand this way too. So in the patients, um, you know, let's say in kids sometimes, when I look and I see, you know, they have sort of the allergic shiners underneath, they have the dark circles Ask the parents, so yeah, they're sleeping, you know, mm -hmm. you know, 10 hours a night, you know, and there's no reason for that to be the case. That tells you that's probably something that's going on. That they're not getting the rest that they need. Mm -hmm. And so in those cases, then we'll turn around and say a lot of times they're flat here, so they don't have good development. Mm -hmm. And what we end up doing is we put in, uh, like one's, one appliance is called the Functional Anterior Growth Guidance Appliance, okay. where we push the jaw forward and it expands out as well, right? Mm -hmm. And other ones are just simple expanders that will try and expand the upper jaw just to, again, create space um, as a result. So, yeah, both of those, uh, you know, work extremely well. Um, we also have little appliances that if adults, it's much easier than with kids, but sometimes there actually are preformed uh, sleep uh, appliances that if a kid will wear at night, it'll bring the lower jaw forward too, mm -hmm. just like we try to do with most adults, right? And we try to make sure that they're, you know, comfortable with that. Yeah. And then is that usually going to happen before a kid go through braces, for example? Usually that's uh, stage one of most things. So most orthodontists will want to correct, um, will want to correct um, um, most of the cross bites and different things like that where um, you want to try and expand the jaw usually beforehand. Yeah. And, um, and that's done usually before braces, before all the adult teeth come in. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to most orthodontists, they'll tell you that, you know, again, the braces are for the adult teeth, yeah. you know, mostly when they come in. But any correction of the jaw, et cetera, should be done at a period of time when the child is growing maximally mm -hmm. or, uh, or in a situation where there's negative consequences to waiting, yeah. right? Like there would be if a patient had a crossbite or if they yeah. didn't have good airway to breathe. And do you think there's like awareness of airway issues in children especially like I know sleep apnea has kind of been a buzzword over the last 10 15 years but in children you wouldn't think of it even like when you know we were talking about doing this podcast like yeah. sleep apnea in kids it's like oh yeah oh yeah that's a thing <laughs> is it something that has kind of emerged recently or is it always kind of been there and we just haven't been aware of it well I think it's, a, it's kind of it's such a it's such a um a wide it's, it's sort of a topic that I think is um so spread out. And when we talk about kids, you can't just isolate on one thing. And of course, because we're dealing with so many different things at the same time, I think what ended up happening with sleep apnea, I think somebody probably came along after they saw all the medications that were being yeah. subscribed for ADD and ADHD yeah. and turned around and said, you know what, there might be something different going on here. Mm. How can it be all of a sudden we have issues here? Yeah. And then I think when you go into the foods that we eat of today mm. and, you know, all those things will make a difference. And now all of a sudden kids are maybe a little more, how, how many more peanut allergies do we have? All those things that we have that are affecting us. And so they're saying maybe those things are affecting us and we should start looking at, you know, and I think the link to that is the child, child isn't sleeping that well, right? So you can get the sleep apnea basically is you're getting the hours in, but yeah. you're not getting the oxygen in. Simple yeah. as that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where, yeah, I think that's where it came from. And I think just over the years, even sleep apnea, I mean, I've been, you know, working with it. The first appliance I ever made for sleep apnea was, 
probably about 19 years ago. And yeah, so it was, I, yeah, I, I done, it's called the Clearway Appliance and we did it a long time ago. I really found it interesting. Didn't know much about it. We did most of those appliances for snoring, yeah. right? We didn't really do them for sleep apnea. Yeah. And so, you know, and with, ch- with children, it definitely, there's definitely some challenges because we can't make the same level of appliance that we can for adults. Yeah. Right. But I think as with, and I think with us as parents, you know, we, always want to do the best for our children and we want to make sure that they're doing okay and I think when your child wakes up and is like you said agitated irritated why would that be the case they slept well there shouldn't be an issue you, you're feeding them well everything else is yeah. going well right so you know as long as we're that's that's why I think maybe it is just the last couple of years that mm. it's always been around but it just takes a while for it to gain momentum I think more than anything else and it's a lot of learning involved too yeah. I've over the years that all the training that I've taken it changes I mean even the people that I've you know from sleep apnea mentors, I'd probably say there's about six or seven of them that I've gone into quite detail with, right? Yeah. Over the years, right? And each one you learn something new and, you know, it surprises you. Oh, it's a puzzle, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think the more, I think it's very clear, the more you know, the more you realize you don't <laughs> yeah. know, right? You're it's fresh. almost like you went down, you went down <laughs> a another path. rabbit hole. Yeah, you went down a rabbit hole. It's like, really? I thought I understood yeah. this all. And it's what's nice yeah. is that, and I think that's a testament to, our society and testament to the level that you know i think doctors dentists you know scientists everyone's trying to get at answers it's it's a testament saying you know we're not stopping right we just keep trying to find more and more so i think you just you take with a humble approach and just say okay these are the things that you know we think are happening every child's different Mm -hmm. and that way you have to try and you know, I, I think the biggest thing is to ask the questions and i think as what ends up happening is most times when i see a, a mom and a child it's I want to listen to their story. Yeah. I want to hear what she's talking about, what's going on, because it's not always just about sleep apnea. There may be other issues, right, yeah. where they can go over there. Even, it sounds silly, I mean, but even chiropractic, you know, care or something like that, there'd be scenarios where, you know, children aren't, don't have alignment and they have things that are bothering them that can make a difference. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's things like that that nobody would ever have thought of before, yeah. right? You know, but all of those things are out there and they have their tools in our chest that we try to use and, and I think uh, just working together, we try to find, you know, the best the best for the children that we, you know, that we're trying to serve. So Awesome. Well, for the Coles Notes version for everyone watching and things like kind of the bullet points to take home for moms and dads, you know, who are listening to their kids, say the number one thing that they should be looking out for is their kids snoring, hey, especially when they're not sick. I could say, yes. And then, like, is there anything that parents can do? Like, what are the, you know, top two or three things that, parents can do to either help prevent this or get it addressed like what you know say they hear their kids snoring what's the action plan number one make sure that there's no they've you know if there's any allergies or anything like that you yeah. know if it's make sure that they've addressed that with the food make sure that that's okay mm-hmm. so i think it's the primary thing is just to ensure like for example if you took milk or something like that you know at, you know before bed or something like that that might have a little bit of an allerg- allergic okay. effect to them right so um we want to think about those things Next, I mean, you do want to talk to, you know, to a, your dentist or a dentist that has some knowledge on the on the subject, right? And I think that's, you know, I think that's an important thing from there. I think just, yeah, just, you know, you can talk to your doctor too. In case I don't know, I'm not familiar with how many doctors are, you know, aware of the childhood sleep apnea yeah. as to where it's at. And, you know, most, I, I actually I don't know. I, yeah. I assume they're just like us. Some of, you know, some of them probably... Oh, no. Yeah, some have some different, you know, different ideas on it, right? So, and then, of course, you get referred to an ENT if necessary, right? Because that's not always the case because sometimes the x-rays we take will show air and, you know, will show, um, you know, constricted airway in the nose, right? So there's ENT operations that are not done for kids as much for adults, but they open the airway in the nose, right? So we can do that as well. Awesome. Well, before we end, is there a place that, you know, People can find you if they want to follow you on either social media or website or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't post too much on Instagram for <laughs> for work yeah. related stuff, but I mean, it's Enduvis on Instagram. So if somebody wants to get all of us, um, again, I'm a dentist um, at River Dental as you are, right? And so um, they can uh, find me there. Um, there's, um, I think I have a Twitter account too. I think it's Med Hat Dentist if I remember correctly. Nice. <laughs> right. So yeah. I think I secured that quickly. I don't know if That's it really awesome. makes a difference as Twitter dies off. Yeah. But uh, I do that, and then, like I said, and uh, of course, you know, our River Dental. We have um, most times people just call down, and we we just we see kids, you know, and uh, we see what uh, you know. In addition to their 
teeth, we evaluate their airways. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. uh, We'll see you at work tomorrow. (laughs) Sounds good. All right. Thanks, (laughs) Michael. All right. Perfect. Awesome. So there you have it, folks. If you made it all the way to the end, first of all, congratulations. That's a long time to be watching a video. You've, You've done well. And if you have questions for either Nick or me, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm sure if you reached out on Instagram and messaged him, he would get back to you. Or um, same thing goes for me too. You know, reach out to me on Instagram. I'm terrible at getting back to Instagram messages. So maybe leave a comment for me here that you've left a message for me on Instagram so I actually check it. And yeah, that was a long-winded way to say, I'll try to get back to you. No guarantees. No, I will try. Anyways. Um, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Like this video and leave a comment because guess what? If you leave a comment, that tells YouTube that this was an awesome video. And I think it was. So yeah, thanks guys. I'm going to end this now. I'll 